Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that uh, we're back with uh, nine full commissioners. Uh, we've had uh, over the last several months, so uh, we've had some uh, vacancies that uh, have now all been filled up. Uh, Commissioner Carvajal, um, who is a great commissioner who will really be missed, uh, is no longer with us. And uh, he has been replaced by uh, former Representative uh, Wenge Newton. And uh, Commissioner, we are delighted that you're here. Uh, your reputation in the Florida House of Representatives precedes you, and it's basically good. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> We're delighted that you're here. Would you like to say a few remarks? Yes, uh, first and foremost, I gotta apologize for my tardiness. And ra reason being is it's my wife's birthday. And we were out late last night, he would have gone a guilt trip apologizing, but my daughter's gonna take her out for a girl's dinner. But uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. As stated, I served uh, uh, eight years on the St. Petersburg City Council back home and then four years in the legislature where I enjoyed uh, working with my colleagues and I look forward to working with my colleagues here to, uh, for the, the, the people of uh, Florida. And I thank uh, um, Speaker Sprouse for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you, and we're delighted you're here. Let me also announce that uh, Commissioner Moore and Commissioner Hankers uh, had uh, scheduled conflicts, and so they are granted an excused uh, absence. Uh, let me make just a couple of uh, preliminary remarks. Uh, we're here uh, in this beautiful facility as guests of the First District Court of Appeal, uh, and we have to respect uh, their rules and regulations, uh, one of which is that no food or beverage other than water uh, is allowed uh, in this room. Please silence your cell phones. Um, we record everything for obvious reasons, so anyone addressing the commission, uh, please speak up so our recording equipment uh, can uh, pick you up properly. And uh, same goes for members of the commission. Please speak into the microphones. I ask everyone uh, to be as concise uh, as, and as brief as possible, uh, but we don't want to limit what you need and have, have to say uh, as you speak on various items uh, for consideration uh, today. Uh, pursuant to Florida Statutes 860114, uh, members of the public have an opportunity to input on matters uh, before the, the commission uh, other than cases in which we act in a quasi-judicial capacity. Uh, this means the public can have input on matters other than complaints and opinions and determinations and uh, so forth. And if you desire to be heard, uh, please uh, fill out a speaker card. Uh, Ms. Fulford uh, is waving her hand in the back of the room, and she has that information and will be glad to assist you. The uh, minutes of our last meeting have been circulated and you've all had an opportunity to read them. So do I hear a motion that they be adopted? So moved. Second. All right. It is moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, like so. All right, show it adopted. Um, that takes care, and that takes us into uh, the Item four, consideration of final action. And that is a DOA recommended order. Um, well, the parties are their counsel in the case of complaint number 18185, Jeffrey M. Siskine. Uh, please identify themselves. Melody Hatton served as the advocate. Okay, no one else. Uh, we have before us a recommended order of the administrative law judge uh, in, in this complaint um, recommending that respondent did not violate Article 3, Section 8, Florida Constitution, Section 112.3144 uh, of the Florida Statutes. Uh, neither the respondent nor the advocate have filed exceptions uh, we have uh, received a copy of the transcript 
and the proposed orders from the hearing. And uh, we have drafted uh, an order uh, for your consideration. Uh, as uh, there were no exceptions filed, there appears no reason to allow argument uh, by uh, uh, either the respondent or the advocate. Uh, we still will proceed under the provisions of the Florida Administrative Procedures Act. And that means that uh, we're unable to reject or modify a finding of fact unless we determine that there is no competent substantial evidence to support the finding. And uh, if we reject or modify uh, a conclusion of law, we have to find that our substitute conclusion was as reasonable or more reasonable uh, than the judges. Um, if any members uh, want to undertake a review of the record uh, to reject or modify, uh, we'll need to continue uh, this item uh, to the December meeting. Uh, the transcript uh, is extremely uh, voluminous, and uh, while staff has thoroughly reviewed it, uh, we have not made copies to distribute to the members of the commission uh, simply uh, because we are thinking that we may not have to. Uh, but uh, if you reject this order, then we will do that and we'll uh, bump it over to the next meeting. Uh, are there any uh, motions, questions, or discussions by members of the commission? Mr. Chairman. Senator, uh, Commissioner Gates. Mr. Chairman, I move that uh, the recommendations as contained in the memorandum from our general counsel adopted. Second. second. All right. It's moved and seconded. Um, are there, is, is there any discussion? Not appearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Show it adopted. All right. That takes care, it takes us to consideration of final action uh, item uh, 4B. Um, this is the case, uh, complaint number 20-060-073 and, and 103, all consolidated in regard to Douglas uh, Underhill. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I have a disclosure. Uh, when this matter first came before us, uh, I made a disclosure and I'd like to make one today as well. Um, uh, of the three complaints, uh, one of them is a gentleman named David Bear. I know him uh, for about a year. Uh, he and I served on the same nonprofit board together. I have no business dealings with him, I have no financial dealings with him, uh, but I, and therefore I don't believe that my, uh, uh, my disclosure uh, would prevent me from acting uh, appropriately uh, on this case, but I did want to make the disclosure. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments uh, from commissioners? Uh, we have before us a, a recommended order uh, of the administrative law judge uh, in this case recommending that the commission find the respondent violated section 1123148 sub 4 and 1123148 sub 8 of Florida statutes. And uh, those violations recommend uh, a public censor and a reprimand and a civil penalty of $5,000. Uh, both the respondent and the advocate filed written exceptions and both parties filed responses to the exceptions. Uh, and we have copies of the exceptions for the record. We also uh, have a draft order recommended by our staff which analyzes each of the exceptions. And the order also recommends finding a violation of section 112313 paren 8 of the Florida statutes and a $7,500 penalty in a public censor and reprimand for the violation, uh, bringing the total recommended civil penalty for all three violations to $12,500. Uh, the uh, Respondent and the advocate will be given 15 minutes each for argument and rebuttal. Uh, the advocate will argue her exceptions first, and then the respondent will reply. Uh, the advocates uh, uh, will have more time for rebuttal. 
uh, and of course commissioners can uh, ask questions uh, uh, at uh, any time. Um, I want to uh, remind you that the under the APA, um, we're unable to reject or modify the finding of fact unless we determine there's no competent substantial evidence supports finding. And we reject or modify a conclusion, we must find uh, that uh, it was reasonable uh, under the circumstances. Uh, Ms. Miller is the advocate um, who is here for the respondent. Mark Heron on behalf of Federal Assembly of the Respondent. Okay. We recognize you in. Uh, I don't uh, need complainants here. Hmm? I don't need complainants here. Are, are there any complainants here? Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, before we start, are there any questions uh, of members of the commission as to the procedure that we're doing? It's a little different than the normal case that comes before us. So I want to make sure everybody understands the posture uh, that we're in with these multiple complaints and uh, how we got to the total uh, of, of $12,500 when they're all wrapped together. Uh, any questions or observations? None appearing, Ms. Miller, you're recognized. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Elizabeth Miller, advocate for the commission. I'd like to reserve any remaining time, please. There are two issues I want to focus on. The less complicated issue is the definition of solicit, which I'll address first. The standard of review in which you review conclusions of law from an administrative judge is de novo. Under this standard, you review the case as if it were brought to you for the first time. You do not have to give deference to the ALJ's conclusions. Instead, you are free to take a fresh look at the legal conclusions. To refresh your memory, the respondent was embroiled in several lawsuits. He established a GoFundMe account for the sole purpose of, of uh, getting or raising money for his legal defense. The ALJ found that the GoFundMe account was not a solicitation, therefore he did not solicit, the respondent did not solicit Fred Hemmer, who was found to be a prohibited donor. I quote from the ALJ's uh, finding in paragraph 49, given that there is no evidence that Commissioner Underhill directly contacted Mr. Hemmer in order to obtain a donation to his legal defense fund, the advocate failed to prove by clear and convincing evidence that Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Underhill violated the solicitation statute. First, I urge you to reject the ALJ's interpretation of the statute. <coughs> that is, that solicitation has to be direct or person to person because that would create an unadopted rule. Second, I ask you to adopt my exceptions nine and 10. The respondent did, in fact, solicit donations. His solicitation reached the general public, including vendors, lobbyists, and other prohibited donors. As evidence that he was soliciting money, the words used on his GoFundMe account were fundraiser, donate, donate now, and donate please. Nowhere does the law say that a solicitation must be personal, direct or active as opposed to passive, as the ALJ found. That is not an element that I had to prove. The ALJ simply read that into the statute, and it significantly narrows the law. To adopt this interpretation would exclude any indirect gifts, which the commission has recognized, and general solicitations, such as mail outs which the commission has also recognized. And as you well know, all general electronic communication, which has become the most prominent form of solicitation these days, would also be excluded from the definition. GoFundMe accounts and other general pleas for donations are in fact solicitations. The record established that the respondent could have put a disclaimer on his account stating that donations from vendors, lobbyists, and other specified individuals exceeding $100 could not be accepted. He did not do that. Competent substantial evidence does not support the ALJ's finding, 
and he misunderstood the solicitation statute, thus he misapplied the law or the facts to the law. I ask that you amend the necessary findings of fact, reject the ALJ's conclusion of law, and find that respondent did in fact solicit a donation from Fred Hemmer, who was a prohibited donor, and that he did violate the law. Such a conclusion by the commission is more reasonable, it is a more reasonable conclusion of law than what the ALJ came up with. The second issue is more complicated. It deals with the corrupt element. Even though the commission should be highly deferential to the ALJ's findings of fact in upholding that competent substantial evidence standard, I'm not going to throw away this fight. I'm requesting that you amend the conclusions of law and find that respondent did violate the misuse of public position statute. The ALJ found in paragraph 96 that the most serious charge concerned Commissioner Underhill's release of the shade transcripts. The sole basis for the ALJ's recommendation for the finding that respondent's actions were not corrupt was that respondent made statements that he believed he had a duty to release the confidential transcripts. This was even though he was advised of the law and took an oath of office to uphold the law. Based on his interpretation, the ALJ ultimately concluded that as a matter of law, while Commissioner Underhill's release of, release of the shade transcripts was reckless and ill-advised, the evidence did not establish that his action was done with a corrupt intent within the meaning of the statute. The respondent's testimony was so inherently unreliable that it can, could not provide a sufficient, competent, substantial evidence as required to support a finding that he did not use, misuse his public position. The only basis in the record for this finding is that respondents uncooperated, self-serving statements. Without cooperation by other competent evidence, this testimony does not constitute substantial evidence, especially in the light of the findings of the ALJ. What the ALJ did find is that respondent is not a lawyer. He holds top secret security clearance with the Navy. He had at least one conversation about releasing the transcripts with the county attorney, Allison Rogers. That was his own testimony. The ALJ found that the respondent had written notice 22 minutes before he released the transcripts that he was not to release the transcripts. Those records were confidential. The litigation was still open. The records were confidential until the conclusion of the litigation, and they should not be released or shown to the public or the media. She also cited the applicable statute in, in writing. Again, 22 minutes after he released, after he released, uh, 22 minutes after he received notification, do not release the transcripts he released them to Kemp Evans. He did this, as he testified, because he disagreed with the idea that Escambia County be involved in taking over a utility. If advice of counsel is mitigation when considering whether an eth ethical violation has occurred, certainly advice by your own attorney, the county attorney, over 20 times verbally and in writing just a mere 22 minutes before he released the transcripts is evidence of corrupt intent. The, the respondent testified that at a minimum, the county attorney told him not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, not five times, not six times, not seven times, not eight times, not nine times, not 10 times, not 11 times, and not 12 times, and probably more than 20 times, do not release the transcripts. But he did anyway. If you adopt the staff's recommendation and find that respondent did violate subsection eight, which is the disclosure of confidential information, he, and that is information that was not available to the general public, 
and gained by reason of his public position with the intent to secure a benefit for Kemp Evans, if you find that, you have an underlying violation of the law. And that's inconsistent with the proper performance of respondents' duties. And it was done with a wrongful intent. I submit that the conclusion that the respondent did abuse his office is more reasonable for the additional reasons. The ALJ's ruling damages the Commission's authority in this case and all future cases that follow by effectively establishing a defense to a corrupt act. And that is, I thought it was consistent with the proper performance of my public duties. This is equivalent to the ignorance of the law defense or other poorly fabricated excuses. These exceptions are filed with the understanding that the Commission may not reweigh evidence or credibility of the witnesses and may only reject or modify findings of fact if they are not supported by competent substantial evidence. Competent substantial evidence is evidence that has, that as will be, that will establish a substantial basis of fact from which a fact at issue can be reasonably inferred or such evidence that is sufficiently relevant that the, that an end material that a reasonable mind would accept it as adequate to support the conclusion reached. I submit there isn't substantial evidence to support the ALJ's conclusion of law, and I ask that you reject his conclusion of law. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller, and you have uh, four minutes and 43 seconds left. Thank you. Mr. Heron. <coughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, Mark Heron on behalf of Douglas Underhill. We start here today uh, from the recommended order. And on August 4th, the ALJ entered a recommended order finding that respondent violated 112.31484 by knowingly accepted one or more contributions to his legal defense fund from vendors and or lobbyists, also that he violated 112.3148 by failing to disclose contributions to his legal defense fund and violated section 112.3148 again by failing to disclose a gift of legal services. The advocate has focused on two issues in there, but again, before us, we have uh, the advocates, the recommended order, the advocates' exceptions, uh, my exceptions, and responses by both parties to each other's party's exceptions. You also have before you a draft final order and public report, which reviews and analyzes the exceptions filed by all, in, by all the parties. In my time before you, I need to deal with the recommended order as well as the draft staff order because it's kind of like things are coming at you at different directions and different conclusions are being made and different arguments are being made. In considering the matters before you, I will not uh, repeat the standards of review which your staff has pointed out in the draft final order. I will emphasize, however, uh, a couple of points as to what an agency can and cannot do uh, with respect to findings of fact. An agency may not reweigh the evidence, may not resolve conflicts in the evidence, and may not judge the credibility of witnesses because such evidentiary matters are within the sole province of the ALJ. The advocate has sat here before you today and asked you to reweigh evidence, to evaluate the credibility of Mr. Underhill, and that is what you cannot do in terms of um, reviewing findings of fact. An ALJ is also entitled to rely on the testimony of a single witness in making a fact finding. And even if that testimony is contradicted by the testimony of a number of other witnesses, again, the advocate has asked you to essentially throw out the testimony of Mr. Underhill because other witnesses testified contrary to what he said. And an agency may not reject findings of fact that are supported by competent substantial evidence in order to substitute new fact findings 
even if the alternate fact findings are also supported by competent substantial evidence. That again is what the advocate is asking you to do with respect to the ALJ's findings with respect to 112, 31, uh, 48, one of the gift issues um, involved here, or so the solicitation issue. But, and consequently, if the record of the DOH proceedings discloses any competent substantial evidence to support a finding of fact made by the ALJ, the Commission is bound by that finding. The analysis of the recommended order and the exceptions are kind of broken out into four parts. And the first part involves the advocate's exceptions one through four, which challenge the administrative law judge's finding that respondent did not violate 1123136 and 1123138. Regarding 1123136, the advocate claims in her presentation to you that there's no competent substantial evidence supporting the ALJ's finding that respondent's release of the transcript was done without corrupt intent. To the extent the advocate is challenging the evidentiary basis for the ALJ's finding of no corrupt intent, the finding is one of ultimate fact and therefore can be, can be altered only if not supported by competent substantial evidence. In this case, the competent substantial evidence supported the finding that respondent did not have corrupt intent in releasing the transcripts. Such evidence includes, but is not limited to, respondent's testimony. Cited in the evidence cited would be that he, was the, he believed that he was the custodian of the county's record and that he would be in violation of the law, notwithstanding the opinion of the county attorney were he not to release the transcripts. He indicated that he did not trust the county's attorney's legal opinion on whether the transcripts could be released. He believed he had a moral obligation to release the records as their proper custodian. He believed the county attorney's decision to stamp everything confidential was not appropriate. He believed the release of the transcript was required by the Sunshine Law. He believed that the underlying legal disputes requiring confidentiality had been settled and that it was his job to release the transcripts as government is absolutely dependent on a knowledgeable and engaged citizenry. These are issues cited in the recommended order by the administrative law judge for his basis that there was no violation of 1123136. Competent substantial evidence supports the, ad the administrative law judge's finding that respondent did not benefit from the release of the shade meeting transcript. As noted in paragraphs 31 and 32 of the recommended order, the respondent testified the only reason that he released the transcript was to ensure a knowledgeable citizenry and that there was no gain to be had from the gain that everyone shares by having government in the sunshine. This testimony by itself provides competent substantial evidence to support the ALJ's finding that respondent did not benefit even if conflicting evidence may have been presented. A public officer employee cannot be found in violation of 1123136 if they are simply mistaken. A wrongful intent is needed to, to violate the prohibition. The Abbott argues that other evidence compels a finding that the respondent acted corruptly, and she cited that evidence to you in her presentation. However, the Commission does not have the authority to second guess an administrative law judge's treatment of conflicting evidence or to question the ALJ's finding that the respondent's testimony was not credible or not reliable. The Commission does not have the authority to second guess the AL's treatment of this conflicting evidence or to question the AL's finding, ALJ's finding that the respondent's testimony was not credible. For this reason, the Commission should reject the advocate's exceptions to the extent they challenge the ALJ's finding that the respondent's release of the transcripts was not corrupt under 1123136. With respect to the advocate's exceptions concerning the administrative law judge's finding of fact that respondent did not violate section 1123138 by the release of the trait shade meeting transcripts to Kemp Evans, it is clear that the advocate is asking the commission to reweigh the evidence in order to substitute a new finding, even if the alternative findings are also supported by competent substantial evidence. Other than conclusory statements of the advocate that Mr. Kemp received a benefit from the release of the shade meeting transcripts. There is no evidence of any personal gain or benefit 
which Mr. Kennett received from release of the shade meeting transcripts. Any benefit from releasing the shade meeting transcript was not to Mr. Kemp. And in fact, there was no benefit to Mr. Kemp. For the commission to find that Mr. Kemp received any personal gain or benefit from the release of the shade meeting transcripts would require it to make a new or additional finding of fact, which it may not do. By the suggested revision of finding of fact 45, as noted in the draft final order and the public report, the commission has in fact reweighed the evidence in order to include a new substitute finding of fact contrary to law. Thus the advocate's exceptions number one through four to findings of fact 39, 40, 44, and 45 should be denied because the advocate asked this commission to reweigh the evidence or judge the credibility of witnesses with respect to those paragraphs. So too should the exceptions in the draft final order of the public report be um, rejected. Advocates exceptions five through eight. An agency cannot circumvent the requirements of the statute by characterizing findings of fact as legal conclusion. The mere fact that what is essentially a factual determination is labeled a conclusion of law, whether labeled by the hearing officer or by the agency, does not make it so, and the obligation of the agency to honor the hearing officer's finding cannot be avoided by characterizing a contrary finding as a conclusion of law. Yet the advocate suggests that the commission do just that by suggested revisions to conclusions of law 72 and 77 through specific factual findings that Commissioner Underhill benefited Mr. Evans by releasing the shade meeting transcripts to him, which are based on revisions to finding of fact 45, as suggested in the draft final order and public report, in which the commission reweighed the evidence and in order to substitute new findings of fact contrary to law. The advocate's exception is numbered five through eight to conclusions of law heading and paragraph 72, 76, and 77 should be denied because they are new or substitute findings of fact for which there is no evidence of any personal gain or benefit to Mr. Kemp from the release of the shade meeting transcripts. Show too should the acceptance of these, the acceptance of these exceptions in the draft final order and public report be rejected. As I say, there was a lot to deal with in this, uh, this uh, recommended order and the procedures today and I'm not sure I'm gonna get through everything. But let me talk about the two things that um, the advocate mentioned to you. One is the definition of solicit. The advocates, I mean the ALJ's analysis of the solicit um, requirement is correct. It is consistent with Florida law that requires, and, we, and the ALJ cited it in the recommended order, which requires a solicitation to be direct and not passive and not just out there in the, in the ether world. He based his determination on the ordinary dictionary definition of solicitation, which is cited in the recommended order, and he cited that case law as well. It's not going to cripple the commission's ability to, pro to deal with solicitations if this is adopted. It's not going to be an unadopted rule. It's this, this ALJ's determination based on the law and the dictionary definition of what solicitation means. It's interesting that you had another case before you where the advocate did not recommend a probable cause finding on a solicitation with respect to a GoFundMe solicitation, we, we want to call it a GoFundMe announcement. There was no analysis of that thing as to the universe that received it, but again, the universe would have included vendors and lobbyists to that government agency. But the advocate did not recommend a probable cause finding, in fact, recommended a no probable cause finding. With respect, talk about, let's talk about the penalty here. And I can only talk about the penalty that is recommended in the staff draft. Uh, you will note that in the staff draft that, get the right, right language. <clears throat> in 
the staff, in, this, in the draft final order and public report, there's a recommendation that an additional penalty may be imposed on respondent for determination that respondent violated 112.3138. On page 20 of the draft final order, the draft states, in the past, when confronted with a violation of section 112.3138, the commission has imposed a public censure and reprimand along with a civil penalty of 7,500. C. In re Mickey Rosado. What the draft final order and public report fails to note is that the Mickey Rosado is not the only case that the Commission has been confronted with a violation of 112.3138, nor does it mention the facts which led to that penalty. Briefly, Mr. Rosado, as a member of the Cape Coral City Council, violated the statute by obtaining information in an official capacity about the availability for purchase of certain real property and then use that information for his personal benefit and the benefit of a business entity. In the Rosado case, Mr. Rosado used that information for his potential financial gain. No final financial gain is at issue in this case. In another case which the Commission has confronted the violation of 112.3138, in Ray David Nickenbacher, the Commission used the, the Complaint, I mean, the respondent used confidential information in an effort to get his mother and brother to purchase property that the city was interested in purchasing for the violation of 112.3138. The commission recommended a penalty of $2,000. So perhaps a more accurate statement would be that the commission has recommended penalties ranging from $2,000 to $7,500 for a violation of 112.314, to a violation of 112.3138 but not citing one case where there was financial gain, which is different totally from what's in, at issue in this case. So, since I only have 20 seconds left, and I haven't had a chance to argue my exceptions, I would rely on my papers and the exceptions. The exceptions that we filed dealt with the issue of the money owed to the law firm. The competent substantial evidence before the administrative law judge indicated that there was a billing dispute when Mr. Underhill received this building, finally, he was able to respond to it and paid it once it was all cleared up. Again, uh, I apologize that I was not able to finish my presentation. In 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. That was very comprehensive. Uh, Ms. Miller. Thank you. I just want to address two issues. An unadopted rule is an agency statement that meets the definition of the term rule, but hasn't been adopted in accordance with the requirements of the APA. A rule is defined as an agency statement of general applicability that implements, interprets, or prescribes law or policy, or describes the procedure or practice requirements of an agency. I do submit to you that by defining solicit as person to person would be an unadopted rule. Second issue I'd like to address is the financial gain. No, Underhill did not receive a financial gain, but what he did do, he took away the authority of the entire county commission by unilaterally releasing the transcripts. The law requires a vote, a unanimous vote of all commissioners before the transcripts are released. The second thing he did was damage the county's ability to negotiate by releasing all of the county's strategy. That's the purpose that the transcripts were kept confidential. He allowed the other side to see what the county's position was in a potential lawsuit. Thank you, I have nothing further. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioners, uh, you uh, have had everything circulated to you and we have all read through. Uh, including um, a 24-page recommended order. Uh, you can adopt uh, the final order uh, as circulated, and if it is approved by the commission, I will sign it as chair. Uh, but um, you can't reject or modify the findings of fact unless you first determine from a review of the entire record uh, and, uh, and states with particularity in the order that the proceedings and the findings were not based on competent substantial evidence 
or that the proceedings on which the findings were based did not comply with essential requirements of law. Uh, the Commission can reject or modify the conclusions of law and the interpretation of administrative rules over which it has substantial and substantive jurisdiction but it must state with particularity the reasons for rejecting or modifying the conclusion of law or interpretation of administrative rule and may make a finding that is substituted uh, of its substituted conclusion of law and representation of administrative rules as being reasonable or more reasonable than that was rejected or modified. Uh, retention or modification of conclusions of law may not form the basis for rejection uh, or modification of findings of fact. Uh, the Commission may accept the recommended penalty but may not reduce or increase it without a review uh, of the complete record and without stating with particularity the reasons in the order citing uh, to the record in justifying the action. So. Uh, Commissioners, uh, the order is before us. Uh, if it is approved, uh, then we have concluded this case. If it's not approved, or if there is a substitute finding, then of course that will be discussed by the commission and voted upon and the prevailing will of the commission uh, will apply. So, um, do I have a motion or any discussion? Mr. Chairman of Parliamentary Inquiry, uh, is now the time for uh, questions and discussion, or do we wait for Mr. Mayor to speak and then uh, have that opportunity? Well, okay. I mean, to, 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 does he have any other opportunity to speak or any other? Well, I, I, I thought he had his time. He didn't ask him any questions. He can ask him questions. I mean, he, he has spoken and uh, he did run out of time before he finished right. everything he wanted to say, but that was his one shot at the podium. Okay. But uh, it's a point where, I mean, he, he can still be asked questions. Certainly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Certainly. <clears throat> Commissioner Gates. Uh, debate being in order, discussion being in order, um, I'd like to go to the, uh, the uh, issue of soliciting because one of the uh, exceptions that, uh, that the advocate has made is uh, to disagree with the, uh, with the ALJ who said the soliciting had to be direct and personal person in order for uh, there to be a soliciting to have occurred and hence uh, illegal soliciting in this case. Um, I think that, that all of us who've been involved in politics in one way or another realize that, uh, that a contribution uh, may be solicited more in more ways than just uh, directly. Uh, the chairman indicated in his instructions to us that uh, we may modify conclusions of law uh, when we find that there is a definition or definitions that are reasonable under the circumstances. And that's the key point I want to make. The circumstances in which uh, uh, these uh, contributions were solicited uh, were the political world. And it's true that the dictionary definition of soliciting may have, may have one uh, limited uh, approach, but soliciting in politics, it goes far beyond or is different from a dictionary definition. Um, I think that language should be understood in the context of its use, and I believe that's what the chairman uh, may have referred to when he said that a, a, a definition we may modify conclusions of law when such modification is reasonable under the circumstances. Uh, in the political world, and that's what we're talking about here, the term solicit does not mean or does not require face-to-face -face personal contact. I'll give you an example. 
I know a member of Congress who in the last four election cycles has uh, received contributions from 100,000 people in those four election cycles. Uh, it, would be, it would be factual to say that at most, he may have directly asked 1,000 of those 100,000 people for contributions. The other contributions he solicited the, through the method that's used often in politics today, and that's the internet. It, it wasn't a GoFundMe page, but it was a, uh, an appeal on the internet. Please, you know, in the GoFundMe page technically, but it was an appeal on the internet for people to contribute money. And in, in making a request of the general public for, for funds. And that consequently led to uh, about 100,000 contributors over the course of four election cycles. Um, now, if we, were, if we were to go over to the Elections Commission, uh, or if you'd go within, within the three miles of this building to a dozen different political fundraising uh, entities, and you tried to say that the only funds that were obtained, uh, that were solicited, were those that were solicited from people face to face, uh, I think folks would raise eyebrows and maybe laugh at you. Because the context in which we're operating here is the political world in which fundraising, direct fundraising, is done through the internet and does not require face to face uh, uh, activity in order to be um, in order to be uh, known as solicitation, um, and therefore, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, I would ask that we at adopt the advocate's position that the uh, that the respondent in this case did misuse his public position and did in fact solicit contributions and received contributions uh, inappropriately and unethically and in violation of the law. So you are speaking in favor of adopting the proposed order? I'm speaking in favor of adopting the proposed order with the, uh, uh, agreeing with the advocate's uh, exception to the ALJ's, uh, to the ALJ's conclusions of law. Is that a motion? I, I offer that, that that debate, and if the chairman, when the chairman uh, suggests that uh, a motion may be in order, I'll offer a motion. Okay. All right, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, I move, well, first let me ask you a question, if I may. Uh, may I ask a question of the advocate? Sure. And of the respondent? Yes. <coughs> if indeed um, a motion that I might make is successful, and we adopt uh, your argument, in effect, as to soliciting. What effect then will that have on the uh, penalty? It seems to me that uh, the $12,500 penalty uh, doesn't include uh, a, uh, a penalty related to this matter. So do you have any recommendation for the commission as to increasing the penalty, therefore? Through the chair, yes, sir, I do. Thank you for asking. I would ask that the penalty be raised at least by $1,500 for the solicitation only, added to the $7,500. To for a total of what, please? Oh, gosh, now you're asking me to do math. 10000 I think $7,500 and $1,500. Oh, it, oh, 12, five. oh 13500 14. 14. 14. Oh. <laughs> Good thing you went to law school. I married an engineer, so I don't have to do math. <laughs> uh, and then, so, there, given, given our, our struggle with that matter, um, I would have to ask, what would the, uh, apparently then you feel that, that that's simply a minor matter, $1,500. Again, through the chair, I don't consider it a minor matter at all. Um, what I really would like is removal from his public position. I don't think his actions warrant him being a public officer if, in fact, he made, if he violated all these laws. But I don't consider a solicitation to be minor. So you're at how much, 14.5 down then? Yes. 
Fourteen even. Fourteen even. even. Okay. Yeah. I have to follow up to it on that same. Mm -hmm. What is the maximum penalty under law? Maximum. The maximum amount. Sorry. Through the chair. Maximum is ten thousand dollars per violation. Two. So that means the maximum basically would be twenty thousand if he chose to go that route. Well, there were. Excuse oh. me. There were more violations found than just two. Um, it would be 10 per violation. So it'd be 10 for the solicitation, 10 for the, um, I think there were three others. Three others. So total, with the solicitation, there would be $40,000 in penalty, top amount. Yeah. But removal from office is also a penalty. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a uh, parliamentary question? Certainly. Um, Mr. Chairman, I noticed that the, uh, that the uh, that the proposed recommendation, proposed order, uh, style that we recommend to the governor uh, that uh, the respondent be uh, sanctioned uh, and fined. Is, uh, did I misread it or was there a, a sentence construction problem here? Are, are we not sanctioning if we uh, adopt the motion here? Are we not fining? Or is that matter for some reason being referred only to the governor? I thought the only thing to refer to the governor was whether he ought to be removed from office. I don't think that's true. Everything goes Help to me. The uh, <coughs> Steve, uh, you're recognized. Through the chair. Uh, Commissioner, uh, with all final orders that uh, we issue where there is a penalty, we refer that to another body to impose. So for most individuals, most public officers, most employees, that's the governor. For sitting members of the legislature or those who committed their violations while sitting members of the legislature, then we would refer those to either the speaker or the Senate president, depending upon which chamber they sat in. Um, but there is always somebody else who would impose the penalty because we are not an executive branch agency, for example. We do not have that enforcement authority. So we have to, we have to refer that under the, uh, the law. Mr. Chairman, if I may ask, and thank you for educating me. Um, so all of the penalties that we impose are referred to the governor? They're referred to, most of them are referred to the governor. All of them are referred. Most of them are referred to the governor. Some, as I said, mentioned, for members of the legislature are referred to the speaker and the Senate president. And when the penalties are paid, they're paid to the governor? They are paid to the general appropriation fund. Mr. Chairman, in that case, I, uh, I do have a motion. I move to, uh, to uh, approve the recommendation uh, which is before us with the addition of a finding that um, the respondent did misuse his public position uh, by soliciting uh, and consequently uh, a, a fine of uh, $35,000. A point of order. Uh, before, you, before there's a second, uh, or when you said, you said you uh, moved the recommended order. The recommended order was the DOA. You're talking about, though, the draft final order is what you're talking about. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, Representative. I'm talking about the, the draft final order with the uh, change or addition of agreeing with the advocate's recommendation as to soliciting and then um, increasing the penalty uh, to $35,000. Second. Steve. I want to make sure that I'm understanding because I don't want to repeat the math issue that we just had before. We were just at, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the draft final order before you is at $12,500. The maximum that we discussed was 10000 per additional, 10000 per additional violation. I just want to make sure that I've got my numbers right because we're adding one additional violation and we're going from 12,500 to the number that I heard, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was 35,000. So are we adjusting the other penalties too? And if we are doing that, there's a, there is a, there's, we're gonna need a little bit more information so that we can draft that. And uh, so I, I, was, I just wanna make sure that I understand before we get to a vote. Mr. Chairman, since my motion uh, is, uh, I've made the motion, but it hasn't been seconded no, yet. It was. It was yeah, seconded. Second. Second. All right. Thank you. Then um, <laughs> let me ask General Counsel. Um, my intention here is to increase the penalties, 
because this is a serious matter and that's dragged on for years uh, because of the uh, of, of delays uh, in the process, not caused by this commission or its staff. It's just, it, as I say, it's serious. So consequently, I'm asking that the that uh, we go from uh, uh, $12,500 to $35,000, and in my judgment, and the advocate can certainly help us with this. Uh, I would uh, raise the penalties uh, proportionately uh, in the case of, uh, of each of the violations to uh, achieve the $35,000. That is my intent. It is also, since all of this matter is very referred to the governor, and I also agree with the advocate's position that this individual needs to be removed from office. Now the fact is that uh, there have been delays, which in my view were designed uh, to drag this matter out so that uh, uh, he'd be very near uh, the end of his term. Um, but notwithstanding that fact, I believe this commission uh, should be, uh, should not take cognizance of how much time he has left in his term, but should uh, agree with the advocate that uh, he should also be removed from office. So I apologize um, to my fellow commissioners, but I ask uh, that my motion include the recommendation of the governor that uh, Commissioner Underhill be removed from office, and I would ask my seconder if he would be willing to uh, accept that in the motion. Let, let me uh, call upon Steve to clarify my possible misunderstanding, but. From a parliamentary uh, respect, I, I have a little problem with your motion, Commissioner. I, I think the proper thing to do would be to have a motion to adopt uh, the order as presented, and then uh, an additional motion made by you or someone else uh, to amend it in the way that you have recommended prior to our taking a vote on it. I, I think that clears up a, a possible parliamentary problem because, you know, we have a presented order before us and you're saying I move but. I think that needs to be bifurcated into two separate motions. Gets us the, the cars in the same garage, but it, it just, is a little cleaner way of doing it. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So you would prefer a motion uh, and then, assuming it's seconded, before we vote, you would prefer amendments to that motion. Exactly, exactly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does that, Steve, does that make better sense? Probably not to the staff. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, and I, don't, I don't say that facetiously or uh, flippantly. I, I, I think, you know, we've had more complicated motions from you in the past and then we walk out sometimes with a differing understanding of exactly what has just transpired. If in the past, when we've had these types of draft motions before, um, you've usually made one motion to adopt with the, with the change that, and then you tell us what the change is that you're looking for. Um, as we get through the motion that has been made, at some point I would like you to rec recognize us because we have, this, we, the staff, when we, we have some things that we would need to do in order to accomplish what maybe you're trying to accomplish. Um, so we would need additional information, perhaps through the motion. Um, and we can get to that in a second. But the, an the answer to your question is, his original motion, as, as, as the way it was framed as, as a parliamentary posture, that was, that's consistent with what this commission's done in the past. Okay, so on, on the other issue, I think maybe Gray wanted to speak, <coughs> if you would recognize Gray. Gray is in a, a good position to address some of the things that we need. Okay. Right. right. T t thank you, Chair. Taking into account Commissioner Gates's uh, uh, thoughts here, I just want to clarify exactly what we need from you to be able to amend a recommended penalty, and then I want to go over then what would be the five separate allegations that we would be uh, finding and recommending a violation of penalty on. 
you know, the, the Administrative Procedure Act is pretty clear that an administrative agency can modify a penalty and even reject a penalty if it's coming from an ALJ, but only if it states on the record with particularity its reasons for reducing or increasing the recommended penalty for each particular offense, setting to the record to support its actions. So if you want to raise a penalty proportionately to 35,000 for each of these different offenses, we're going to need to explore each offense and, and have a, some reasoning from you as to why. Um, there are five offenses. If you adopt the draft order that, that, that the staff has prepared and add Commissioner Gates's recommendation of finding a violation on the solicitation prohibition, there's going to be five different offenses found. Uh, the first one would be that 112.313 subsection 8 violation, which is in the recommended order before you, uh, about the disclosing of the, the shade transcripts. And on that basis, we're recommending a $75,000 penalty. 7,500, I'm sorry. And a, a public censure and reprimand. Uh, the second offense then would be the, the solicitation that Commissioner Gates is talking about. That would be a section 112.3148 subsection 3 offense based on the solicitation through the GoFundMe. The third offense would be a section 112.3148 subsection 4 offense. Uh, in that a lobbyist of the county chipped in over $100 towards that GoFundMe. Right now, the administrative law judge is just recommending a public censure and reprimand on that. The fourth offense would be a section 112.3148 subsection 8 violation because a, a non-prohibited source, somebody who is not a vendor or lobbyist, also chipped in more than $100 towards that GoFundMe and it wasn't reported. On that basis as well, the ALG is re just recommending a public censure and reprimand. The fifth and final offense uh, is again a failure to report a gift under 112.3148 subsection 4. That would be the, uh, the ALJ's finding that Clark Partington, which was a law firm, uh, basically gifted its legal fees to the respondent uh, because they went unpaid for such an extended period of time. And the ALG on that is also recommending a public sanction reprimand and a $5,000 penalty. So in other words, there'd be five different offenses, you know, and we would just need an explanation from you as to why you feel in each of those five cases we need to raise a penalty, uh, and we would need an explanation of, you know, what you want the penalty to be. Okay. Uh, well, would you prefer that we make a new motion and then amend that? I think the, the best thing to do and what you have done in the past and what's made it very clear when you've amended these penalties and you've done that in um, the Range case, you did it in the Lussie case, you did it in the Campbell case. Um, when you make your motion you, uh, to adopt the staff recommendation with the added uh, finding of a violation for 112.3148 sub 3, the solicitation, um, and then because that, uh, yeah, we are, I think we already have enough information on why you feel like it's that finding is, that conclusion of law being flipped is more reasonable. I think we, you've, you've said enough on that that we could, uh, if you incorporated those statements into your motion, we think, I think that that would be sufficient. And then we would need a statement as to, on the five violations, what you want those penalties to be and what from the record you're drawing upon or the commission might be drawing upon to, to do that. We um, might be able to assist you in navigating that record a little bit here, um, but if you wanted to start the, you know, tell us which, give us an itemized list of what you want to do on these penalties, that would be a good start. Parliamentary standpoint, then, uh, do you want to take up the motion uh, that's on the floor, or do you want me to withdraw that motion? Well, um, we've we've got to put it in writing. But does Steve's description meet what you want to do? Yes. Okay. Then I think we will simply we can keep the motion and state it as Steve has outlined and you have agreed. All right. And I, I, Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding then that, that staff wants to know how to distribute the $35,000 fine uh, 
among the offenses that are uh, alleged. Yeah, yes, uh, through the chair, and the reason for that is because we, in the, in the final order, when we set out to draft this thing, we will have to explain uh, with particularity, citing to the record, why each violation required a, pen, a, a certain penalty. So we will have to pull things out from the record, evidence from the record. The evidence is all tied to specific violations, so we'll be doing that in reference to particular violations. Also, we'll have to demonstrate for the potential appeal that what we've done is not an abuse of our discretion, meaning that the statute does provide a range. We'll have to demonstrate that for each violation we were within the range, for example, would be one of the things that we would need to do. So in order to do that, it would be good to delineate now what those numbers are. Is that agreeable, Commissioner? Yes, I would just say to Commissioner President Gates, uh, since it is five, you came up with the number 35, simple math would say spread it across 7,000 evenly. Okay. If that's your work. Mr. Chairman, that, that, that certainly is agreeable to me. Um, I would simply ask the uh, advocate, um, because of the, um, because of the various uh, allegations that are made, because of the various, um, you know, uh, as the general counsel has laid out, the various offenses, uh, I would ask the advocate if she has any comments on, on having uh, this matter styled uh, so that it's seven thousand dollars per uh, offense, or whether she has a different view of the matter based on the severity of, the, of these uh, of these offenses. Thank you, through the chair. Again, thank you for asking. I believe the disclosure of public records is extremely serious. Um, he, he, Mr. Underhill knew not to do it, but yet he did it anyway. And it had all kinds of ramifications, which I don't know that we've seen. However, the judge, the ALJ, also found that that was the most serious offense. I would ask the maximum on that offense. That would be the sub eight. Mr. Chairman, if I may mm -hmm. ask a follow up. Uh, therefore, the maximum under current uh, law is $10,000 for that offense. Yes, sir, or removal from office. Well, and, and that's, that's part of my motion. Um, but in terms of to try to help staff out here with uh, what we're, you know, what, what this motion intends in terms of penalties specifically in each case, if you uh, allocate a $10,000 penalty for this matter, uh, you would take the remaining $25,000 uh, and uh, just as Commissioner Galzine has said to do it in, you know, in, a, in, in a way that's understandable to all of us, you would take the uh, remaining $25,000 and spread that equally among the other offenses. Uh, does that comport with your view as to the relative severity of those offenses? Yes, sir, it does. In, in yes, that sir. case, Mr. Chairman, uh, I believe we have sufficient answers, uh, and uh, I would ask that my motion be understood in the context in which uh, the advocate has just articulated, and that is as to the disclosure of public records offense, the maximum penalty of $10,000, and that the other $25,000 uh, part of the penalty be equally distributed among uh, the other uh, four offenses. Um, okay. Does that work out for staff? We've calculated that to be uh, 10,000 and then 6250 four times. All right. That then is my motion if that's still in order, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I, that is certainly in order and it has been seconded, but Commissioner Meggs, you've been trying to get my attention. <laughs> so I, uh, this, you know, I, um, hopefully this will be beneficial. I don't know if it will or not. But on the solicitation issue, uh, I've heard it said today that the ALJ used a dictionary definition. There is a definition that is in the standard jury instructions for criminal solicitation. And basically, if I remember, Commissioner, it says something about asking earnestly, 
but not you don't have to do it individually. And there's no, no, there may be more to that definition. If that is helpful to you, because we can deal with law uh, as opposed to fact. So solicitation, I know it says ask earnestly, and you could do that on the internet. You could do that by standing on a street corner. You could do that in any kind of fashion. So I would just say that, and that as to the wrongful intent, uh, we, we, we can't judge the credibility of a witness, as I understand it, but clearly whether if, if it was said by the county attorney, don't do this, and then you do it, you obviously had some kind of mens rea, evil intent, because you're going to do it anyway. I don't know if that helps y'all in what you're doing. I, Thank you, thank you. Mr. Okay, um, one of the best definitions I heard uh, was uh, uh, play poker with a congressman and make sure you lose. <laughs> so <laughs> there's lots of ways of going by. Uh, Commissioner Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a little new at this, but I did serve in local government. I want to also um, um, add to um, Commissioner Gates' motion. You know, um, it's not just solicitation, and as you talk about GoFundMe, the accounts that we set up as politicians, they do go out to thousands of people. And when people click that link, it goes right to an uh, Act Blue or account where the, the money is deposited or taken from a credit card instantly, just like a GoFundMe account. So I don't see a difference when you're doing solicitation. We also have this thing called disclaimer and dollar amount, you know, 100, 100 from an individual. <clears throat> Um, no more than a thousand from an individual or a business, so we can't. We have to have those disclaimers in there. Um, I wanted to say that, but I also want to speak to the part about removal. And if I can ask a question of the um, the, the um, Mr. Underhill's attorney uh, re representative, would Mr. that be in a, would that be in order? Mm -hmm. uh, my question would be: um, Did Mr. Underhill, uh, upon being elected to office, did he uh, receive an oath of office? Did he swear an oath of office uh, um, in, in for the public record when he got elected? Did, it's did he, in the record. record. It's an exhibit in the record that he did take the oath of office. Yes. Okay, I'm a little new, so you have to bear with me. Also, my other uh, um, question would be: Was Mr. Underhill uh, provided as a commissioner, like I was a councilman, legal counsel on the, on advising on the operation? of our city business and, um, and information that we receive? I would, if you read the record, you would have noted that there is, the, the county attorney attempted to provide Mr. Underhill with legal advice. Okay. By the same token, the county attorney refused to defend him and uh, when requests for attorney's fees were made legitimately. Um, so, again, um, and, and the reason I'm asking, I see um, a complaint in here. I think it's um, David M. Bear. And from what I see his title, it's he's a commissioner for Scampi County Board of County Commission. So I think that's one of his colleagues. No, Mr. Bear is in the back of the room here, and he's not on the county commission. Yeah, that's his title. Okay. Okay. But you do point Thank out you. there's a lot of controversy, again, in the record between county commissioners and Mr. Underhill. Right. Thank you. Are there further questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, while, while Mr. Heron is Commissioner up there. If, <laughs> so I, uh, you heard uh, Commissioner Meggs and Commissioner Cervone talk about in terms of definitions related to criminal matters. And, of course, we're not in a criminal matter here. Uh, would those definitions be appropriate in, in a well, situation like this? To the same extent that the advocate indicated we have an unadopted rule issue, we're, I believe you're creating the same issue here with respect to defining it by either a criminal standard or any other standard. Again, what courts look at routinely, if it's on, a, on an undefined term, is the standard dictionary definition. And follow up to that, is there a definition in Black's Law Dictionary? Well, And I don't again, know if you cited, I mean, you may have cited it already. No, I no, no, I mean, um, I, I, 
I'm going to the recommended order. The recommended order does cite to uh, uh, Merriam-Webster or something like that, a dictionary like that. They didn't use blacks. Mm -hmm. And again, in this new world of the judiciary, they like to go to a um, new world of the judiciary. They like to go to standard dictionaries. Mm -hmm. And and to, uh, to understand clearly about the solicitation, because I think we're only really talking about the one, and correct me if I'm wrong, the one donation that was made to it by a lobbyist or somebody who was doing business with the county. Is that, relatively speaking, what we're talking about? I don't believe so, and I believe there's been some confusion here by bringing in the political solicitation issues. Usually political solicitations are sent to people. I get 100 of them a day from candidates from Congress, for United States Senate, everywhere, then the legislature. I get 100 of them a day. That is a direct solicitation. We're not talking person to person exclusively in the recommended order, but that is a direct solicitation that the candidate has sent to me. GoFundMe is out there, and somebody goes to that. It's not a solicitation directed to any particular individual. It is direct, it is out in the world. So this comparison, in my view, to political solicitations is misplaced. And just one, one more, and so uh, Ms. Miller mentioned that of course, he could have put on the solicitation, assuming that's the solicitation, if we're going to say it's a solicitation, on the GoFundMe, he could have said, okay, no, and I'll go to what uh, Commissioner Gates had talked about. I would imagine those political ones you're talking about would also say no foreign nationals may contribute to this campaign because, of course, if it's the United States Congress, they cannot. And if they don't have that on, then I venture to say they have solicited so to foreign nationals, and if they receive money from foreign nationals, they've now committed a federal crime. But that's an aside, and we talk about that another day. But so she said that the GoFundMe could have disclaimer on it that says you can't give if you are such, such, and such. I don't know anything about GoFundMe pages other than what I hear, and what I, actually I think the first I've ever heard of them is, is up here. So. Uh, how do they work, and, and, and is that possible to prevent somebody from giving who, who shouldn't give? Uh, staying with the record, that's before you. The applicant did ask that question, and Mr. Underhill indicated that he, there could be a disclaimer on there, yes. And, and if there were a disclaimer, that person could still give. But again, the issue is the solicitation. It's, it's not the giving that we're talking about here. It's the solicitation out there in the ether world on the GoFundMe page. That disclaimer would be a warning to somebody who would be giving, but the solicitation perhaps would still be there. Thank you. Mr. Chair, another follow-up. Thanks for moving. Um, to, that, to that question, I mean, to that answer, if I sent out an, a solicitation um, and um, it is emailed and this is also broadcast over Facebook, and more times than not we say please share so that's over the whole universe that you're talking about. But also in there is um, we have, when they do click that link, there's normally disclaimers when you get to where you're going. Now I know about GoFundMe, but there's rules. And that's why I think while we're here, there's rules as it pertains to elected people. I mean elected officials and people that sworn oath of office and also um, disclosure for elected officials. The normal uh, Joe Public who's doing a GoFundMe page uh, is not governed by those rules. Is that correct or am I misspeaking? Correct. Thank you. I mean, unless, unless, with one exception, unless they're a lobbyist or a vendor to the county, that's the public, if they gave, they would be in violation of, the sta of a statutory provision. Well, if I could, Mr. Chair. We also have times that we can do it. We can't do it, I guess, as a legislature where you're in session. Uh, you can't do that and, and have things like that. So we're governed by a lot of different rules that we uh, um, swear to uphold and protect when we swear an oath of office. So I'm trying to make sure we compare apples to apples when we talk about the universe because when we send out to ask for money, we want everybody to give, not everybody, everybody. I mean, anybody want to click that link, that give, but once they get there, we have got to have the proper disclaimers in place and make sure that we're doing things factual in order pertaining to the oath of office and the laws that we swore to uphold, protect, and defend. I concur with you, and all those requirements are clearly set out in the statute that 
those things. But again, when I receive a solicitation from politicians, candidates, I've even received them from you, yes, Mr. Sir. Newton. Um, it is directed to my email address, direct solicitation. Commissioner Cerrone. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I, I'd like to note that I don't think either Commissioner Meigs or I were at all suggesting the imposition of a criminal standard on this, merely making that as a reference to language that might be illustrative or helpful to the, to the staff. When, we're not trying to hold them to a criminal standard here by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I am, I, I agree 100% with the advocate. The, the disclosure issue to me is by far the most egregious thing that happened here. Uh, I tend to be agreeing with what Mr. Heron is saying. I, I'm bothered by this concept of pushing a button and sending something out to the whole world, literally the whole world, anyone, anywhere who wants to see it is the same kind of solicitation as a direct solicitation. It's, I, I'm, I'm not as offended by what happened there as I am by the failure to report contributions that came in. I think it's the obligation of the recipient of the money. I know this is burdensome when you if you're getting a lot, I never got a lot, so it wasn't a problem for me to look at each contributor and know whether it was a prohibited person or not, or a, an, an amount that was more than it was supposed to be. That to me is different than pushing a button that sends something to goodness knows where. Right. Mr. Chair, I have one more quick question. Oh, Commissioner Gelzine. And uh, this is to the respondent's counsel. Um, and I just need a little bit more clarification on your presentation earlier. Whereas the uh, advocate uh, for section 112.313, I'm sorry, 313, section 8, about disclosing information, you were leaning on the area of sunshine that they have the ability. So expand on that just a little bit more of why this, why is the sunshine law will trump the, the disclosure of certain information? I may have not been clear, totally. Not, that's why okay. I'm the issues with respect to the Sunshine Law were the reasons, and the, based on the testimony of Mr. Underhill, were the reasons why the administrative law judge did not find corrupt intent for the purposes of finding a violation of 112.3136, misuse of public position. Okay. The, with respect to 112.3138, the administrative law judge said, hey, the corrupt intent issue is not an element of that violation. And as a consequence, I find that Mr. Underhill did violate 112.3138 when he gave the shade meeting transcripts to Mr. Kemp. And we didn't have an analysis at that point of, from the administrative law judge of the 112.313 of, of the corrupt intent issues. I may have bled over some of that because that testimony was used to, in my exceptions, was used to also try to blunt a finding of a violation of 112.3138 because it was all kind of taken up at the same point in time. Okay. So I apologize if I created some confusion there. Thank you. Are there further questions or comments uh, from commissioners? Commissioner Wallman. We're going to go comments, so we're, I guess, into our discussion on this. Is that at this point? Uh, yeah, let me, let me make a suggestion. Um, I, th I think we all understand what this significantly changed order is going to say. And I think staff understands what they have to do to put it together. But once they do, it's going to look a whole lot different than what's before us. Um, if we adopt it and we adopt this motion, staff will redraft the order. And as chairman, I'll have to sign it. But I want to make sure that what I am signing is the intent that Commissioner Gates and everybody else has. So it seems to me there are, there are two ways of approaching this. One is we just simply 
vote to approve Commissioner Gates' motion. We direct staff to change the order to reflect that motion. And I sign it, it's a done deal. But that way, none of you are going to have the opportunity to see the final crafted order before it's signed. So the other alternative, and I certainly, this case has been around a long time, and I certainly don't want to kick the can down the road anymore, but I want to do things right. The other alternative is to adopt Commissioner Gates' motion in concept, direct the staff to redraft the order to so reflect, and then put it on the agenda for a final vote in December. So I'm not suggesting, I'm just saying those are a couple of alternatives for the commission to consider before we take this vote. Commissioner Savon. Mr. Chairman, I very much like the idea of having it back before us in December. Uh, Steve. Definitely take the lead. A couple of things about that, and um, as you as you consider it, but let me say up front, there's a um, so that when we get these recommended orders from the, the ALJ, the a, the APA, the Administrative Procedure Act says we have 90 days to put forward a final order based on that recommended order unless the parties waive uh, the 90-day requirement. Without having asked, I don't know whether or not that will or will not happen. If we go beyond the 90 days, what the courts have said is that we now look at whether or not there is a harm to the party uh, against whom we are ruling. If there is a harm uh, to them by going beyond the 90, then the, one of the remedies that could, the court could issue is that the order becomes unenforceable. So there's a risk going beyond the 90 if you choose to go beyond the 90. The other thing about going beyond the 90 is, and I, I haven't done the calendar day math on this, but since we're now talking about removal from office, the next meeting is on December 2. It's, it's not clear to me if he'll, that will still be a remedy that would need to be included or not. So if you decide to go beyond the 90 days, which this would put us beyond the 90 days at that point, um, we would need to ask for the consent of the parties. If they do not consent, then you have to make a decision on how, whether or not that's something you, you want to pursue. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner uh, Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I certainly was uh, prepared to uh, defer to Commissioner Simone and others who might want to see a final order uh, in, in a form other than the motion that I've been making. But now that we've uh, heard from General Counsel that we, we'd be beyond a 90-day limit, we'd have to go uh, into a delay that would have to be agreed to by all parties. And functionally, the, uh, the severe pen most severe penalty, which uh, the advocate has recommended, is removal from office, mm -hmm. would be rendered moot if we w wait till December. And, and I fear that that's exactly what the respondent wants. I agree. And so consequently, uh, reluctantly, uh, I would ask the chair um, uh, to uh, take up the question on the table and pass it. Well, uh, general counsel's response to my very good suggestion uh, <laughs> causes me to realize it wasn't a very good suggestion. <laughs> so before you vote, you, you've given us at least by our count, a very, uh, an explanation as to why the s disclosure uh, warrants an increase in the, uh, not an increase in the penalty, but why it warrants a $10,000 penalty. You've discussed with us the solicitation sufficient f that we feel like we could write something up at this point. You haven't uh, discussed the, or pointed out what you want us to seize on as far in the order as to the lobbyist donation that was accepted by the respondent. The ALJ recommended that by accepting that lobbyist donation that was in excess of $100, that public censure and reprimand and no penalty would, would be warranted. We are increasing that to $6,250. Um, $6, um, a little bit of a discussion on that would benefit your staff immensely. The 
reporting on the gift from the individual, the lack of reporting the Form 9 from the individual who was not a vendor or lobbyist. Uh, the ALJ recommended that that was a public censure and reprimand, no, no penalty, no civil penalty. Uh, a discussion on why we're increasing that to 6250 would be beneficial to your staff. And then lastly, the law firm, the legal services, the, the finding of a gift and the lack of reporting of that gift, the ALJ recommended a $5,000 penalty, <coughs> public center reprimand. We are increasing that by $1,250. So we would need to do a discussion of that increase also in the recommended order. Mr. Chairman, to, uh, with your permission, sir. Um, in or I, I believe my motion is based on my, uh, my agreement with the advocates a recitation of the significance of each of these offenses and why they uh, why they ought to be taken seriously. So, with your permission, I would ask the advocate um, to uh, to respond uh, in each of these cases and uh, explain for the record why each of these are serious offenses and uh, a penalty is justified. Thank you again. I believe that aside from the disclosure of public records or public document, pardon me, disclosure of confidential documents, the other offenses are pretty much in the same category of severity and would warrant a, a fine of 62.50. The respondent has shown that as far as gifts go and as far as reporting gifts, and taking in donations, he has total, absolute disregard for the law. I think that 6250 is appropriate for those four offenses, with the eight sub eight being the most egregious offense. Excuse me, Bob. Um, it's required that we cite to the record um, for the reasons why the penalty would need to be increased. If, 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 and I know there's good policy arguments potentially for this, but um, if you. We'll, we'll need some some pointers to the record, if you have evidence. I don't have points to the record right now. I don't have the record with me. I can get those to you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, what, I, what I was in, in my night, what I was trying to get at was to understand exactly where we're at. If if what we're saying is that we're going with the draft final order with just increased penalties is really all that's, that's added. It means we're accepting all of the exceptions that, if we vote in favor of it, we, all of the exceptions that the advocate took and basically, which basically sets aside a good portion of what the ALJ found. I mean, that's really where we're at. And I, and I wanna make sure that's, that's what I'm understanding is, is correct. And I think that's a good summation. Yes. Yeah. All right. So if we're if no, I no. may, <laughs> if I may, for clarification purposes, no. uh, the I don't believe you took my exception as to one twelve three one three subsection six. That was the um, misuse of office. I don't believe you adopted that exception. Well, I th it's in your it's in the draft final order. Not it? not the misuse of public position. That was not. We did not recommend adopting that exception in our on our draft order. So that's the only one. But I other, argued it otherwise, today. everything else. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Commissioner Newt. Yes, um, just a point of information. Uh, to Commissioner Gates' motion, um, the advocate stated that it was a ten thousand dollar max fine, up to and including removal from office. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Can he amend it just to say that? Would that cover the uh, removal part? Because that's in the fine. It's ten thousand and or removal from office for a betrayal of public trust, I think. I'm just regurgitating what I heard. Because he's, he's talking $10,000, but he left out the removal from office part. So if he amended it to match what the max fine is, wouldn't that include the uh, removal from office? Or penalty, I'm sorry. Office on one count and censure and reprimand and the other ones 
mean, I, at this point, to get to the, I think it's a mathematical tautology that all of these need to be adjusted in order to get to the number that's been proposed. Um, the public, the removal from office is a separate penalty, so we can tack that on to all, to some or all of them and and and, and do that. That's, and I. I think it's pretty clear at this point that you guys, the you as a board, are reading into the severity of the the what you perceive as the severity of what's happened here, and that the removal from office is warranted. Therefore, I think we can script that in pretty clearly because that that's certainly been made clear to us. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my motion, and I realize we've had a lot of discussion. My motion included the recommendation for removal from office. I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, we, 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 we did miss that last comment. My motion, I believe that if you go back and review the record of this meeting, my motion included uh, the recommendation for removal from office. Yes, and we, and we have that. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if Mr. Schaefer could just make a couple of references to the record that might uh, satisfy, if you, if things that we might write in, he could propose some things that we might write in that might solve the, the issue of what we're going to write in the final order. If he could just make some suggestions and see if that's satisfactory for the board. Yeah, we have, uh, everything is uh, obviously, uh, uh, the whole record is uh, available. Um, and we've had a lot of discussion and it, Sounds complicated, but it really isn't. No, not really. Uh, we're, we're really talking about changing a few numbers and making a couple of other statements. Uh, so uh, what, what I'm going to do uh, is temporarily pass this. We've still got a number of items uh, on the agenda. And uh, could we put the order together within the next 30 minutes or so? I think I think Mr. Schaefer will be able, I know we could give the record to another individual in the room, but I think Mr. Schaefer can propose what you might need and then we might be able to just vote after that. If. Mr. Mr. Chair. Yes. Okay. I'd like to, I know we're, we're talking right now about the order and what we're gonna put into it, and yet we haven't even had debate yet on this. I can say, as it's written already, if we're going to talk about it, I don't agree with where we're, the direction we're heading. I think the ALJ <laughs> had a very deliberative and concise decision and recommended order. I think it's accurate in terms of what the facts were. He was the one who uh, heard all of the fact witnesses. And now it appears to me that what we're trying to do is replace his fact judgment with ours and you may disagree with the law or his application of the law as it relates specifically the one to the solicitation and we're, and recognize we're talking about a contribution if I if I keep reading this I think a single contribution of $250 from a developer in st. Petersburg who also happens to do some work in Escambia County and ultimately that was I believe it was reported, it probably should have been, I guess it was, it was reported, or it wasn't reported, and that's one of the things we're finding he didn't do, that he improperly did. I believe it was returned, but I, I can't say for sure, but that's also indicative of how difficult this case is in terms of the facts. And we're starting to, in, in, in essence, conflate all of these issues, the corrupt intent. It was found that he violated the law by disclosing the shade meeting uh, transcript. But, that, and, and, and that's one of the allegations in here. That's one of the things, the findings is in here and we, that he's done that. But the corrupt intent was it didn't benefit him. There was no benefit to him. And I know, it, and, and Mr. Heron went through it in his, in his exceptions, uh, as well as his, his response, all of those things. I just think we, we've gone off on a tangent here where we're, we're making this much larger than what it is when we don't have the benefit of having actually been there. But we have the benefit of the transcripts, of, of, of the exhibits that were here, and all of those things. It's a very reasoned 
uh, decision that the ALJ made. And I think we're, we're here just trying to put things together as if we're cut and pasting. And, and it's, not that, it's not that easy. I mean, it, it's so straightforward with what the recommended order is. So if, and I don't know that we do this uh, here as well, and, and probably it's not going to be successful even if we did, I would make a substitute motion if we do substitute motions here. Okay. Further comment? Mr. Chairman, may, may, thank you, sir. May we ask uh, that Gray uh, articulate what he uh, wanted to articulate that I believe will help clarify and explain uh, the motion, the, in, the effect of the motion? Through, through the chair. Right you know, all we need here in the order is to be able to justify or explain from the record why we're increasing the penalty in, in these offenses. Like Steve said, I think we already have enough explanation from you all regarding the 112, 3, and 3 sub 8 disclosure uh, allegation, as well as regarding the solicitation allegation that Commissioner Gates has raised. That leaves us with three others. Uh, two of them pertain to the acceptance of funds through the GoFundMe. Uh, that's a 112.3148 subsection 4 violation for accepting a gift of over $100 from a lobbyist. Uh, the other one is a section 112.3148 subsection 8 violation for accepting a gift of the GoFundMe of over $100 from uh, a non-lobbyist or vendor, but just not reporting on the Form 9. I, I would ask for Buff's assistance here. Uh, maybe she can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if we're going to justify raising a penalty in those cases, and we have to cite to the record, something we could cite to would be the fact that I, I believe, and Buff, correct me if I'm wrong, that the county attorney advised him that if he were to set up a GoFundMe, wasn't there testimony indicating that he had to comply with a gift law? And that is in that is in the record. If I may, Mr. Chairman, yes, that is in the record that the county attorney advised him before he started the GoFundMe account that he should be aware of accepting gifts from vendors, lobbyists, and other prohibited donors. She attached along to, with the email that she sent him numerous commission opinions relating to the subject. I believe she pointed out the law if he wanted to read the law. She told him he had to comply with the gift law if he accepted donations to, to make sure that he applied with the gift law. Uh, it also, that is in evidence. The email and the commission opinions are in evidence. Okay, that, that leaves us commissioners then with one other allegation that we're, we'd be raising the penalty on, and that would be the section 112.3148 subsection 8 allegation that he received a gift of legal services from the Clark Partington Law Firm. Right now, the ALG is recommending $5,000 on that, plus a public censure and reprimand. We're looking at raising it to $6,250. If you look at the draft order that I prepared for you all, and particularly at pages 21 and 22, I point out some facts regarding that particular allegation that I think the commission, if it chooses to do so, could rely on to raise that penalty. Uh, including the fact that Clark Partington's engagement letter specified that legal services were due within 30 days after receipt of an invoice, that the respondent did not pay every 30 days after receiving an invoice, um, that nearly five years elapsed without the payment from the time that the, the case closed to the time we finally paid Clark Partington, uh, during which time he only paid $300 of, of his over $5,000 in legal fees. Uh, and finally, that um, there was testimony from, I believe, a Clark Partington attorney that they only sent him, a, sent him the final invoice after an ethics complaint about this matter had been filed, putting it on full blast that that bill had not been paid. If the commission were so choose, those pieces of evidence are already in the recommended order, and it would be up to the commission, but it could determine to rely on those findings as a justification for raising the penalty to 6250. May I add something? Not only did he get the final invoice after the complaint was filed, he sought out what he owed after the complaint was filed. He took affirmative action then. 
Those are just suggestions as to why the commission could justify raising the penalty based on evidence uh, in the record. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Gates. Mr. Chairman, I would ask that the commission take uh, a formal notice of uh, the uh, information uh, provided by the general counsel's office uh, that link um, the offenses to uh, and, and the requirements uh, for uh, having a justification for penalty we link them uh, to the pen to the offenses that were referenced. I just ask that we take notice of that and that the record be uh, reflective of that. Can we call the question? Commissioner Max. Yes. Yes. I said, can we call it up for a vote? Oh, okay. I, I didn't get an answer though to my question about a substitute motion. That was what I had posed. Was I mean I I don't think it'll be successful, but I would certainly make a substitute motion if it's appropriate if we do that here and I don't I don't know whether this would be similar to uh, legislative rules of course I fully expect my substitute motion to go down but I just was going to make it anyway well, are you yeah. making that as a motion I would like to make right it would be a motion it would be a substitute motion and that would be to accept the uh, uh, ALJ's recommended order or the DOA recommended order. Is there a second? None appearing, it fails. Okay. All right, uh, now let's get back uh, to uh, action on Commissioner Gates' motion. Um, before we take a vote, uh, and what we have decided to do is we are going to uh, approve uh, the order as redrafted to reflect what's in the motion. Staff is working on doing that. Uh, but we're open for discussion or debate before we take a vote on the motion. I just have one final comment, and that's just, if I understand correctly, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, with the fines, we're actually going to be for more or less setting a precedent for fine amounts uh, because some of these things are, are much greater than what we've done in previous actions. And I just want to make note of that. And, and that's okay because I think we all, or those of us who've been on the commission for a little while, have thought that some of the fines are, are too low. Well, I, we I refer back to what I think you said a couple of meetings ago. Uh, when we had uh, uh, a matter and uh, you felt that the fine was almost de minimis uh, given the gravity of the situation and the uh, cost of pursuing it and all of that. And so we, I think, all agreed. Uh, and I'm certainly totally with you on that, that, that fines ought to be more reflective of the severity uh, of the conduct involved. And that's one of the things that we're doing here. And, the fact that we haven't done it that severe in the past doesn't mean it's wrong to do it now. I, and, and I agree. I I'm not looking to go back and forth with it, but I, but I agree that, that fines should be increased in general. i just making note of it. My objection, and I'm going to vote against the, against the motion, is because I don't think we should go beyond what the recommended order was of the ALJ who actually took the testimony, uh, heard all the argument. I think he had a very reasoned legal argument for where he came down, uh, and I think we are substituting our uh, subjective opinions uh, in, in place of uh, what I felt was a very a good order. Okay, is there further discussion? All right, none appearing. Uh, Steve, do you have a question? Just one last thing, just, I, cause just to tidy up this last conversation that we did have about the 90-day requirement uh, I ex had expressed worry that the uh, uh, council might not waive the 90-day requirement to allow us to draft and present you with a clean draft. Um, it appears that he would waive it, um, although it's still the case that uh, it, he, uh, he, the respondent, is leaving office <laughs> sometime at the end of November, and our meeting would be on December 2. So there is the issue of the applicability of that penalty would not, would be moot at that point, but you would have a clean draft. 
Okay, thank you for that input. Further questions or discussion? No. All in favor of the motion made by Commissioner Gates and seconded by Commissioner Gilzean, say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. No. Show it adopted with one negative vote. And uh, staff will redraft that order uh, in accordance with this motion. And I will, as chairman, sign it. Uh, I will ask uh, staff just for our edification uh, once that, is, that process has been completed uh, to uh, email it to all members of the commission so they would have it uh, for their files. All right, uh, that takes us to the next item, which is uh, Item five, uh, in Ray Roger Brooks, complaint number 22-022. Uh, this is a, uh, a proposed priest probable cause stipulation uh, between the commission advocate and the respondent. And uh, this matter is being considered in public session because the respondent in signing and filing a pre-probable cause stipulation waived uh, confidentiality. Uh, complainants have the right to comment in writing on proposed stipulations. We've not received any comment uh, from the complainant in, in this case. Now, it's, this makes it a little bit complicated <laughs> uh, in that subsequent to the filing of the stipulation, uh, the respondent filed a motion to re, re, uh, withdraw the pre-probable cause stipulation. And uh, that uh, motion has just been uh, placed uh, before you. Uh, so the first order of business would be to consider uh, the withdrawal mo motion. And if the commission were to grant the motion, we would immediately proceed with the consideration of a, of a probable cause. Um, however, my understanding, Mr. Herring, is that you wish to now withdraw the motion no. to withdraw. Is that correct? We, no, it's been, it's been a moving, to me where we are. Yeah, it's been a moving target all morning, and I apologize to the commission, um, and I'll try to keep this very simple. Um, I did approach the staff this morning and indicate that I, my intent was to basically abandon the motion to withdraw, but in subsequent conversations with my client um, and with the advocate involved as well, um, there is a, we, we wish to basically, um, again, withdraw the pre-probable cause stipulation. And the reason we want to do that is because there is a very unique provision in the Bonifé City Charter. And it's, it's, it's on the bottom of page two of my motion, which was just handed to you. And that, that provision essentially removes or provides that a member of that commission forfeits his office if it's determined that he has violated any standard of conduct or code of ethics established by law for public officials, whether that violation is serious, super serious, or whether it's the most minor thing in the world. This provision, and it puts the judgment of that in the hands of the city commission and not this commission. Okay, now, Mr. Brooks has already resigned from this Bonifay City Commission because of this provision. Because it was clear and became apparent they were going to remove him based on the stipulation. Okay. The complicating factor now is that this possibly could be read to preclude him from being a candidate in the future. That's the concern. So we would request that our pre-probable cause stipulation be withdrawn, be treated as a nullity, we will proceed to a probable cause hearing. Um, Mr. Brooks wants his day 
in court to establish that he did not violate the code. And the only way to get to that is to have a probable cause hearing, and if you and your wisdom decide that there is probable cause, uh, to do that. Now, um, so that's why I would, would, would withdraw the joint stipulation. That's my motion. Okay, well, that I think makes it fairly simple. Uh, the motion is before you. Uh, I had a question for the attorney. I'm a little confused. <laughs> okay. I know it's day one and we're throwing a lot of things at you. <laughs> well, I mean, um, you, you said that the gentleman um, resigned. Yes. Because they was going to remove him. Yes. Why did he resign if he did nothing wrong? That's, I guess what I'm saying. Well, I, I know when I. I'm once just that's the, I'm confused that maybe. Okay, maybe once the issue was brought to his attention by the city attorney that they were intending to move forward to remove him from office pursuant to this provision. He called me. I spoke to the advocate about this issue and indicated that I wanted to withdraw the joint stipulation. And so that's, that's the reason, again. And so it's become more complicated because, again, the issue has been raised as to whether this provision is going to preclude him from being a candidate in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I don't, I don't read it that way particularly, but it's a concern. And um, so there's been no finding by the city commission in the event there's no finding at a, following a hearing or there's no finding for another, any other reason that he violated the code, then he would be eligible to be a candidate in the future. Again, uh, again, Mr. Newton, or Commissioner Newton, uh, you weren't here last time when we did this in a probable cause hearing. It was late in the day. Uh, both of us made arguments, and the commission said, hey, we're going to postpone this. Why don't you guys go out there and work it out? <laughs> and, we did, and, we, and we tried to. And it, we just, it, it just became more complicated than it in a normal case. So. Okay. Uh, a motion has been filed to uh, withdraw the pre probable cause joint stipulation. Uh, is there a motion by a member of the commission that we adopt and favorably this motion. So moved. Commissioner Servone moves, is there a second? Second. Commissioner Gates, second. Is there discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed like sign. Show it adopted. So Mr. Heron, uh, the joint stipulation is a nullity. That means that we proceed as if there had been no joint stipulation. And uh, uh, that is that we uh, proceed with a probable cause uh, hearing. Uh, and uh, the respondent and the advocate are permitted to make uh, their statements. And uh, no other uh, testimony or evidence will be accepted at the hearing. If probable cause is found today, the respondent will have the opportunity to request a full evidentiary hearing before the uh, administrative law judge at the Division of Administrative Hearings or uh, enter into a new proposed settlement agreement, which may or may not be a possibility. Uh, each party is uh, given 10 minutes. So Ms. Miller is the advocate. Uh, you're recognized. Thank you. The respondent serves as a member of the Bonifay City Council and as the vice mayor for that council. There are 10 allegations. I believe the evidence supports a finding of probable cause on two of the allegations. That would be allegations 7 and 10. The facts for those two allegations are the same. That is that the respondent contacted a city employee while he was on the job site. He called him off of the job site to come to his home to perform a chore, and that chore was to place a Christmas tree on a higher shelf. I recommend a finding of probable cause on allegations 7 and 10, and no probable cause on the other allegations. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Good 
We would certainly concur with the advocate's recommendation that no probable cause be found on the majority of the allegations that were investigated by the commission and found to be legally sufficient. Uh, focusing on this last allegation um, that about uh, calling the uh, a city employee over to move a, a Christmas tree from uh, a shelf in his in his uh, in his garage, uh, we argued that, um, and in our papers and the report of investigation and our statements to the to the investigator, that. Um, the city employee uh, was not necessarily called over there to do that. He routinely came to the office or came to Mr. Brooks's house to, to discuss business. And while he was there doing that, this ask was made. Um, we pointed out in our response to the advocate's recommendation that um, obviously you could see from the, the, the amount of allegations made by the complainant as well as the city clerk that there obviously had some um, issues with respect to Mr. Brooks and we're working to, uh, from our point of view, fabricate allegations uh, against him. And this is the only one that stuck. Um, again, the advocate in, in uh, overlooks the apparent targeting of Mr. Brooks by the complainant and Ms. Mr. Barbie. Um, the complainant uh, appears to be a local clearinghouse for every disgruntled employee's complaint against Mr. Brooks, many of which are not borne out by the evidence. In our previous, in our previous appearance here before you, we argued that this complaint has taken up a significant amount of the resources of the commission in investigating these cases against these allegations of Mr. Brooks. Again, Mr. Brooks has admitted that he asked Mr. Barbie to help him place a Christmas tree on a shelf in his garage during a time that Mr. Mr. Barbie was on the city clock. We argued last time, and I will argue again today, that it's just not in the public interest to continue to expend the commission's limited resources to litigate further whether he did so with corrupt intent. I will again ask today, as I did before, it is respectfully requested that the Commission resolve this complaint today with a finding of probable cause, but elect to take no further action pursuant to Rule 34.5.006. This is something that you can do. It's, the, the rule is cited on the, the bottom of page 8 of our response previously filed, and we would ask you to do that. If you don't, we will go to hearing to establish there was no violation of the of ethics. Are there questions of Mr. Heron? Yes, sir. Commissioner Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Heron, I, I, uh, that if we were to accept your recommendation and if this matter were resolved by finding probable cause but taking no further action, would it still place the respondent uh, in the position of uh, not being able to run for office in Bonifay? That issue is an unanswered issue under that provision of the code. But again, there'd be no violation found by this commission. The, commi the other commission would have to determine whether, in fact, an act in the past that's been resolved by A, his resignation, and B, by this commission, I guess, granting clemency, so to speak, based on the facts here, whether that would trigger it. But again, it would make a clearer road, even to make a clearer road to let him seek office again. Um, I say that because even if that decision is not in my hands to make, it's in the hands of the city commission over there and I can't speak for them. And that's why I couldn't give Mr. Brooks an assurance that uh, accepting the stipulation for this past act would preclude him or guarantee him the ability to run. I just couldn't do it. Mr. Chairman, may I follow up? Mr. Chairman, uh, I would ask uh, General Counsel to uh, comment on, on this, and Mr. Chairman may, may wish to add something as well uh, with the uh, concurrence of the Chair. Um, if we find probable cause, full stop, does that not 
Does that not indicate that the respondent has violated any standard of conduct or code of ethics established by law for public officials? Leaving aside the question of taking no further action, if we make the finding, uh, does that not does that not indicate that the respondent has violated a standard of conduct or a code of ethics established by law? Probable cause findings merely means that you believe the preliminary investigation established that this warrants um, sending it to a public hearing and uh, potentially having them settle in the meanwhile. It is not a finding by you, an ultimate, it is not an ultimate finding by you that there is actually a violation here. There are plenty of instances where you find probable cause and then the ultimate finding later on is that there was no violation that occurred. Um, and, you know, the, the, the probable cause finding is merely just you warranting that it deserves another look at the uh, public hearing. And so there's no crossing of the threshold here that could be construed by the Bonifay City Council, properly construed by the Bonifay City Council, that if we adopt Mr. Heron's suggestion that we have found a violation, you are agreeing that we would not have found a violation. I, I agree that we wouldn't have found a violation, but I, I wouldn't dare interpret their their city charter, and, sure. how, how, and I wouldn't wager a guess as to how they might interpret it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, when you find it appropriate, I have a motion. Uh, before I do that, Mr. Hearn, for purposes of our record, is the respondent here? Yeah, Mr. Brooks is here. Okay. Sorry, I apologize for not introducing. Thank you, sir. We just wanted to have the record reflect your presence. Uh, Commissioner Gates. Mr. Chairman, uh, I move that uh, the commission in this matter find probable cause and take no further action. Second. There, who seconded? Uh, Commissioner Servone. Is there discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. Show it adopted. Thank you, Mr. Heron. Can you take a quick five minute break? Yeah, I'm going to get ready to do that. Okay. Um, we, we've got several more cases on the agenda, and we've been at this for uh, oh, wow. almost three hours. So uh, I'm going to take a quick uh, uh, five minute break, and that means 15. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we will be back and continue the agenda. Well, that's mine. And uh, the next order. item on the agenda is uh, consideration of final action joint stipulation complaint number 20 116 in Ray Chandler Williamson. Will the parties please introduce themselves? Is the respondent or the complainant here? I don't believe so. Okay. And I'm Elizabeth Miller, advocate for the commission. Okay, you're recognized. The respondent was the Pahokee city manager. <laughs> he used the city-issued credit card for personal expenses such as flights, hotels, and rental cars. In some cases, there was uh, these trips were in, intermingled with a city purpose, but not in all cases. He paid restitution that he was told by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement was owed paid that back to the city. He entered into a joint stipulation and I request that you um, adopt the agreement. Thank you. Um, thank you. Are you, are you through? Thank you, I'm sorry, yes, thank you. I'm, okay. I'm done. Thank you. Uh, recommendation is that we accept the joint stipulation? Yes, sir. Okay. Are there questions? Is there a motion? I move to adopt the joint stipulation. Commissioner Meggs? Second? I'll second it at the risk of it, you know. Don't kill it. Being, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Leave, it, leave it there. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed, like sign. Show it adopted. Thank you. Next is complaint number 21-204, Rodney Braden. Uh, 
Ms. Miller, or you're recognized. Is anyone else here on this one? No. All right, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, this respondent is on the city council for the city of Destin. He also entered into a joint stipulation wherein he admits that he filed inaccurate CE Form 1s for four years. I request that you adopt the joint stipulation in lieu of further proceedings. Thank you. Are there questions? Sure. Mr. Savall. I'm curious as to whether there is a reason for what looks to me like a different amount for the different years based on the same action. Through the chair? Yes, sir. The difference in the amounts is there was one error with an address for uh, allegation one. There were two errors for addresses for allegation two, or in other words, those allegations that are $1,000, there were two errors, 501 errors. I'm asking for a civil penalty of $3,000. Thank you. Thank you sir. Further questions? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. I thought we had a motion. Well, I'm, I'm, I'll so move in, in, in I thought, retrospect. I thought we had one. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll move adopt, adaptation of the uh, okay. advocate's recommendation. All right, second. Second. Commissioner Gates, second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Okay. All right, what's, what's the next one now? Next one is Robin Hatcher. Ms. Miller. Uh, and you are, please introduce yourself. I'm Robin Hatcher, Thank you for coming. Ms. Miller, you're recognized. Thank you. As you just heard, the respondent serves as the city clerk for the city of Bristol. And if you'll recall, commissioners, you heard the probable cause hearing last, um, last meeting. And this is a case where she took $200 out of the treasury box and she put an IOU in there and a few days later put back the $200. She appeared at that time and gave a statement. And you'll recall that during the hearing you suggested that, that she didn't seem contrite or needs to express uh, a, an expression of contriteness for her actions. Since that time she's entered into a stipulation which is attached as a written, written personal statement for your consideration. I recommend a finding, or excuse me, I recommend that you adopt the joint stipulation in lieu of further proceedings. And Ms. Hatcher is here if you'd like to ask her any questions or hear from her. Are there questions? Is there a motion? I'll move it, Mr. Chairman. I move the joint stipulation. Is there a second? Second. Is there discussion? Commissioner, I just want to ask, because I just want, I heard something that I want to double check. That statement, is that incorporated into it? Like we're sending all the statement with the stip to the governor or? No, oh, that's, okay. that's for the commission's benefit. Okay, thank, thank you. Very much. But, but point over, I mean, it says on this, it says to accompany joint stipulation. It says, personal statement of Robin Hatcher to accompany joint stipulation. So it's just it, accompanying for our benefit. If you'd like it to go to the governor, I think that'd this be okay, is, but I would prefer that it not. For the yeah. record, that, that statement is attached to the joint stipulation. Okay. But the order will go, but maybe not this. The, the whole file. I'm, you know what, I'm, whole, I'm sorry, I'm confused. The whole file will go yeah. to the governor's office. Okay. Further questions? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Um, Ms. All right. Uh, the, the next one is complaint number 21 dash. 236, Richard Nelson. Ms. Hadley, you're recognized. Are there other parties here? No. All right, proceed. Respondent was an employee of St. John's County 
After an admittedly interesting hearing last month, the commission found probable cause to believe he violated Article 2, Section 8, Florida excuse me, 8G2, Florida Constitution, and Sections 112.3136, 112.3133, and 112.3137 Florida statutes. Through settlement negotiations, the parties have come to an agreement. Respondent acknowledges that former business, his former business and his business associate received a benefit, even if the county received equipment that saved the county funding. While this does not negate the violation, it can be mitigating a mitigating factor in determining the penalty. In the stipulation, Ramon, respondent admits he violated sections 112.3136, 112.3133 okay. and 112.3137 of the Florida statutes and agrees to the entry of a final order recommending a civil penalty of $4,000. Regarding the other allegations, the parties agree that the facts do not warrant proceeding on allegations that reflect a benefit specific to respondent. As such, we ask for the allegation regarding Article 2, Section 8G2, Florida Constitution, be dismissed. We respectfully ask for the commission's approval of the joint stipulation. Are there questions? Is there a motion? So moved. Commissioner Gozina, is there a second? Second. Commissioner Cervone? Discussion, questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Show it adopted. Okay, um, the uh, next one is complaint number 22-008, uh, Rachel Johnson, Ms. Hadley, uh, you're recognized. Respondent is employed as administrative director with Miami-Dade County Public Schools. He was placed on the list of Form 1 filers after he was identified as one of the employees who had final authority to make purchases in excess of $35,000, thus a pur purchasing agent required to file financial disclosure as a local <coughs> officer. Once, once respondent failed to timely file his 2018 form, he was investigated under section 112.3159C. An order finding probable cause was issued with the case. In preparing for the next appropriate action, my office sought to confirm if respondent was indeed a purchasing agent, agent as defined by statute. Based on a sworn affidavit, which is attached to the motion, that was completed by the chief operating officer for Miami-Dade Public, County okay, Public Schools, okay. respondent did not possess the requisite purchasing authority to be statutorily mandated to file a CE Form 1 for the year 2018. As such, I ask for the case to be dismissed. Okay. Are there questions? All right. Is there a motion? Acceptance of the recommendation. Second. Is there discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Show it adopted. Thank you. The next item that appears on your agenda is uh, file number 2791, uh, consideration of an advisory opinion. And that matter uh, has been continued until the December uh, meeting. Okay, that takes us to uh, item uh, nine. Uh, these are two financial disclosure fine cases uh, where we uh, entered an order imposing a fine. Uh, and uh, it's recommended that we declare them um, uncollectible because in both cases the filer has passed away. Uh, are there any questions from members? And do I hear a motion? Move acceptance of the order declaring financial disclosure uncollectible in both matters. Okay. If I can do it both at the same time. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Close like sign. All right, that takes us to the uh, reports. Um, uh, as chair, I don't have uh, much to uh, report. Uh, Carrie's gonna go into a little more detail um, of how we're proceeding on our uh, legislative recommendations. 
And uh, the one thing I do want to bring up is the uh, matter relating to the budget. Um, legislature, of course, goes into session uh, in March, and uh, they're going to want our numbers probably sometime in early January. And it's necessary that we have a budget workshop. Uh, there are a number of items uh, to consider. Uh, we all know uh, what inflation has done to our personal budgets. Everything from a pack of gum has gone up in price, and uh, that has not eluded uh, the expenses of the administration. Uh, we also do not know um, e exactly uh, what kind of employee complement is going to result from electronic filing. Uh, we're probably going to have to add some people, may have to add some space. And uh, speaking of space, the lease on our current facility expires in 2023. Uh, it's our recommendation at this point uh, that we stay there uh, as long as the uh, negotiated rent is acceptable. Uh, we don't have room for extra employees but there is some vacant space downstairs uh, that we could acquire. So these are all matters that we need to bring up uh, in the budget workshop. Um, last year we did a special meeting. Um, problem with a special meeting is you've got notice requirements and all of that, and we're running pretty short on time. If we had a separate meeting uh, whether it's in person or virtually, it would have to be sometime in December or very early in January. Uh, and it's a hard time of the year to get something that meets with everybody's schedule. My suggestion is that we incorporate the budget meeting uh, into our December meeting. So we'll have our regular meeting in December and uh, then we'll just go right into a budget workshop. Uh, probably will take us, I don't know, an hour and a half, two hours. Um, depends on how much discussion we get in. And so if that's agreeable with everybody, I think that's, that's the easiest thing to do for commissioners. It just means we'd be leaving the meeting a little bit late and uh, get it out of the way. So uh, if if there's no disagreement on that, that's what I'm going to recommend that we do. And I'm going to uh, turn it to Kerry to uh, go into uh, a, a little more detail. But that, that's all I have on the uh, chair's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I might ask for a little bit of flexibility with regard uh, to the budget just to make sure that we have sufficient time to get the information that we need to be able to put together the proposal and have it ready for uh, I think mail out is November 16th uh, for that December meeting. So I'll be in touch with you with regard to um, all of those considerations that we need to talk about prior to that time. Um, other items with the executive director's uh, report, uh, in addition to what you have, uh, we have hired a new staff attorney and uh, he will start with us on the 31st. So I look forward to introducing you to him in December. Also want to let you know that our wonderful legal intern, uh, Alexa, has to leave us from what I understand. Uh, she has been uh, marvelous. Her last day is sometime regrettably in November. We wish we could keep her. Uh, she has been uh, just an invaluable member of our legal team in terms of conducting legal research and uh, doing some ghost writing. Uh, as you know, we've been very heavy in litigation it's been great to have her, her uh, with us, and we will wish you well. well. I don't have any money, but we can clap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she'll take care of that once she graduates from law school. Uh, in addition to that, I mentioned litigation. As you know, we've had a very heavy litigation load, and uh, we got some good news uh, just yesterday in relation to the uh, Ballard litigation, where he's filed multiple things in multiple venues. Uh, his motion for rehearing at the Supreme Court 
was denied, and that was very shortly after we entered uh, our response to that motion, which was drafted by Kathy. Uh, and so that matter uh, on our litigation uh, list will be uh, stricken, and it is, uh, it is over at this point in time. Uh, finally, the other matter I wanted to bring to your attention is the annual Council on Governmental Ethics Laws uh, conference uh, that happens annually, but of course due to COVID has not happened since December of 2019. Uh, this is really the only organization of government ethics professionals. It's an international organization, including uh, governments in Canada and beyond. Uh, traditionally, Florida has had a strong presence with COVID. Um, I've served on a number of committees there. Re regrettably, I had to uh, resign from the program committee for this upcoming uh, COGO meeting uh, because of the demands of the electronic filing system. Uh, but the show goes on uh, without me. Uh, however, I would like to attend that conference in December. Uh, there was a budgeted amount uh, in the budget that was adopted by this commission and submitted and approved uh, last year. There was a line item, I think, for $6,000 in the foreign travel uh, budget. And the reason it's foreign travel is because this year it's being held in Montreal uh, in December. <laughs> So, <laughs> uh, I was, uh, I was, careful planning. I, well, you know, they would never want it to look like a junket. <laughs> so, uh, former Chair Lesnoff warned me that I likely did not uh, own a winter coat that was suitable for winter in Montreal, and I'm willing to bet she's not wrong, but the inside of a hotel meeting room, temperature is always the same, and my coat came to work there. So as long as there's no uh, objection fr from the commission, I do have submi sufficient budget in there uh, for, it looks like two uh, staff members to attend uh, that <coughs> and uh, would very much appreciate your support in that. It doesn't require a vote, but I just wanted to make sure there'd be no objection. And one of the things I want to point out is that uh, when this commission was uh, started, I think 48 years ago, something like that, back in the 70s, uh, we were one of the first states in the country to establish a commission on ethics. And uh, we have become, uh, over the years, a bellwetter. Uh, our uh, various executive directors and other staff people have frequently been asked to, uh, to speak, uh, to be on panels, uh, to make suggestions, uh, to help uh, uh, draw uh, sample recommendations, uh, because of what we have done, a number of other states have followed our programs. Uh, Carrie has been a, a, a tremendous contributor to that, and I think it's very important that every time they meet, we have a presence from the Florida Commission on Ethics, and uh, I have certainly encouraged uh, Carrie to go. I'm not sure who else she's going to take. Maybe her husband, I don't know. <laughs> Not on the commission. I don't think he's going, but it wouldn't be on the commission's dime. If he did. But anyway, I've encouraged her, along with whoever she selects, to attend. I appreciate that. The folks in uh, Montreal uh, working on the, good, on the good side of ethics are wonderful people, and we look forward to their um, <coughs> conference. Uh, turning now to everyone's favorite topic of electronic filing of uh, financial disclosure forms. Uh, we will uh, relaunch Form 6 electronic filing January 1 uh, in accordance with the requirements of statute. As I've mentioned previously, uh, we've had some changes in the IT team. You'll recall that uh, the commission is charged with implementing this system. Uh, the uh, programming and uh, IT team is handled by the Office of Legislative Information Technology which is overseen by the House and Senate. Uh, Lynn and Kim, uh, and Kim for, for many, many hours, have recently been uh, embedded downtown with the IT folks, uh, conducting testing of the hundreds of changes and updates to the programming um, that have been made since we first paused the electronic filing last year. Uh, of course, a number of things were revealed as we went through the uh, truncated filing process. 
last year and uh, the IT team is working to address those uh, items and based on the feedback and demand from filers of Form 6, we are working to uh, incorporate and implement document uploads, uh, which is very uh, complicated in and of itself. So we hope to see that in the future. <coughs> we will go live Jan 1 with filers and coordinators able to access the system. Uh, remember those coordinators are the ones who give us our official list. They're gonna have to work uh, quickly to put the list of filers in place who were in office as of December 31 of 2022, and they will certify that list. That will be the first big thing going on with the system. We will also have a qualifying period, as I understand it, uh, in early January for, uh, for Jacksonville. And aside from that, uh, the rest of the Form 6 filers will be able to uh, request access to the system uh, in order to file their disclosure form, and we'll have the wholesale, what I like to call filing season, later on in the spring, and uh, we will certainly be ready for that. You might recall that last year, uh, around 800 filers or 800 forms were su successfully filed through our electronic filing uh, system. Um, it, it does create some challenges for staff as we anticipate as with anything that's changed or added new in the system, there might be some back end challenges in terms of implementation for us. Uh, I am confident uh, in the ability of your staff to overcome any of those uh, with the patience of the filers. The system, for the benefit of the new members, uh, does seek to walk filers through the form, giving them helpful pop-ups, FAQs, and also employ some business rules to help them uh, properly disclose items to give them uh, a warning if they're trying to put an amount in that doesn't meet the requirement of the form. Uh, we will be putting together um, some little training videos and webinar trainings for coordinators to help access the system. And uh, roughly a third of Form 6 filers filed disclosures with us while it was electronic last year and before paper went into place. Um, we do not anticipate a pause this year and we uh, hope and pray that there will not uh, be one. And we look forward to uh, your support as we work to identify the best way once we get sixes launched to implement this for about 38,000 filers who are Form 1 filers. They do not currently file with the Commission. Uh, not all of them do anyway, and that will be a much heavier lift. So I'll be reporting back to you a little bit more in December and as time goes on. And uh, we're just gonna, we're just gonna enjoy uh, the journey of electronic filing in the coming year. I have a question. Is, is this gonna be shared information or is it gonna be siloed just with the Ethics Commission? Um, the forms, because I know sometimes when, when we file, um, the State Department was able to give them, but we did give them to the Department of Elections, and I mean, where are they housed in one place, and will information be shared, or how does that work? Through the chair, uh, all Form 6s are filed with the Commission on Ethics, with the exception of when you qualify for office, you file them with the qualifying officer. Um, historically, the Commission had already, always sought out those forms, so you could file a copy of them with the commission if you were an incumbent candidate uh, with the change in the law a few years ago. It then made the requirement that the qualifying officer provide electronically those forms to the commission. Okay. And so we get them electronically. Of course, now with uh, online filing, there is still the qualifying piece of it, but ultimately they make their way uh, to the commission and those are uh, published on our website. Because you have city, uh, Mr. Chair, you have city clerks, you have a uh, uh, SOEs, and then you have the um, state op. And each one of them requires mm -hmm. you disclose those forms for qualifying and whatnot, but I'm just curious as to who got what and how did they share it, and was it siloed, or did we have a, mm -hmm. were they able to go and access that stuff? Once we implement Form 1 disclosures, they will file electronically, file electronically with the commission, but they still, of course, have to <coughs> qualify with their local qualifying officer and where appropriate uh, for incumbents uh, we will we will receive that form. Thank you. Or if someone wins election and they're not an incumbent, that form will make its way. But the incumbents will qualify. Um, 
with our qualifying officer, they will electronically <coughs> file their form with us, and they will be able to take a copy of that form to the qualifying officer or a verification or receipt of a placard to complete their qualifying process. Well, the reason I brought that up is yesterday when I was doing my canvas chair, my um, um, onboarding with Steve, we looked to see for my form six. I think we had when it was really old, it was 2020, but I had filed one since then, and I was able to, to go onto my my uh, my qualifying on the, on the election site up under campaign documents and pull that up, and then we were able to see the current one. But it's been sitting there for a minute. But the, the one that's out there for people to see, I guess our office is 2020. So that's why I was asking, was it going to be in a silo or will they share that information? That's why I brought that up. Because that did happen, yes. I don't see that Kim is, is, is Kim, Kim, I can see it. <laughs> uh, Kim, will you look into that for us, please? Yeah, we Kim just, will get that response. Yeah, we just saw that, but that's, that's why I that. And uh, if there are any further questions, I'm happy to answer, and otherwise, that completes my report. All right, are there other questions about anything uh, for members of the commission? Uh, not appearing, Commissioner Newton moves, we rise, and um, we're going to try to turn this around as quickly as we possible, possibly can. Uh, we need to vacate the room and uh, set up some microphones, and so we'll take a uh, hopefully fairly short break and come back with the executive session uh, in probably 10, 15 minutes. <laughs>